Hello, everyone. Greetings from Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement, NICE. I am Ashmita Gautam, and I welcome you to the NICE International Women Summit 2020. NICE International Women Summit 2020 is organized to bring together the dynamic women experts. It is the first women's summit organized by NICE. By organizing this summit, we hope to create an exclusive space where women from different areas of life can share their expertise with young, aspiring females. At the time when there is a flood of male panels, or let's say, manners, our aim is to reflect the fact that there are enough excellent women experts in the field of international relations, foreign policy, and security issues. As you all know, we have we had around 71 experts from 12 countries, including Nepal, India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, United States, United Kingdom, Russia, Armenia, Philippines, Switzerland, and Indonesia. There are 10 sessions that took place at two Zoom rooms simultaneously. And this is the 10th and the last session of the summit. It will be moderated by Dr. Smuti S. Patnayak. She is a research fellow at Manohar Parikar Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis. She is also a member of IDSA's task force on neighboring countries and is the coordinator of Pakistan project. Dr. Patnayak has been a recipient of many international fellowships and, special, and specializations in uh, South Asia. Dr. Patnayak has published more than 60 research articles in various peer-reviewed journals, both in India and abroad. Her current research project is titled as India's response to China's presence in South Asia, challenges and policy options. Thank you. The floor is yours, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Asmita. Thank you for that uh, introduction. And uh, I would like to thank more than NICE for uh, getting me uh, to participate in this uh, very vibrant uh, Women Scholars uh, Summit. Uh, because many of the time you don't really get a platform, uh, especially the women scholars, you know, to present their view. So therefore, I uh, look at this as a very great opportunity. And I would congratulate NICE uh, for, uh, you know, uh, taking this initiative. Um, like uh, today we have uh, around seven uh, speakers and uh, most and the topics are very diverse and extremely interesting. And most of them are also very, very topical. And uh, so I would not take much time because, you know, I was told that uh, I should uh, give it to the speaker much. Uh, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Uh, Namrata Goswami um, first, and uh, her topic is um, China's grand strategy in outer space. And all of us, we know she has been working on outer space for quite some time, and it is uh, really going to be a very interesting uh, discussion. Namrata, over to you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Patnayak, and uh, thank you, Nice and Pramod and Ashmita for inviting me and for doing such a great job. Uh, I have a PowerPoint presentation, so if you could bring that up, Ashmita. Or do you want me to uh, share it from my side? Actually, uh, Dr. Pramod is about yes, to- Please share it yourself because uh, like, it's taking time. Okay, I'm sharing mine, no problem. Can you see it now? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah, it has come. Okay, so uh, today, uh, what I'm going to speak in 10 minutes or so is to talk about China's uh, grand strategy in space. And so, um, so if you look at the concept, so for instance, when you talk about grand strategy, so in my perspective, grand strategy is the highest level of conceptual policy making that establishes how a state prioritizes and mobilizes their military, their political, economic, and other sources. And what is interesting from China's perspective is that it also matters on what the end goal is. So for instance, countries might have the end goal of survival. They might have an end goal of pursuing a particular domestic interest, or they might have an end goal of establishing a particular specific international order. And so in that sense, their strategic culture really matters. 
And so I define strategic culture as a sum of assumptions about the reality of the world. And so this reality is basically conceptualized through threats and opportunities. And what is even more interesting is that if you look at it from a conceptual level, grand strategy and strategic culture is very much influenced by a state's political culture. And I find this uh, definition in Stephen Rawson's uh, you know, article on effectiveness of military culture, the most exciting and the most relevant. And so he argues that political culture is a shorthand expression, which actually is something that limits your alternative options of how do you behave. So your country's culture, your country's politics might actually limit your options to what is possible in the realm of international relations. And so strategic culture basically flows from political culture. So in that context, China's grand strategy in space is very much determined by its political culture, which sometimes limits its options to how it would behave in the world. But you know what is so interesting from the perspective of international relations theory is that China wants to use its uh, advantage in space to become one of the most important great powers in the world. And as we know today, without space, you cannot do anything. In fact, our, our meeting today might not have been possible if it was not supported by satellite-based uh, communications. A military cannot go, for instance, to the India-China border if you do not have satellite command and control and reconnaissance. We might not be able to use GPS if we do not have satellites. So our society, especially in a COVID-19 context, we realize is so much dependent on space that it's become a very critical component of international relations, posturing and, and politics. So if you look at China's grand strategy, and that's why China is so much invested in its space program. So its historical example influences China's space behavior. And by that, I would say that it's a loss of the treasure ships in the 15th century, which led to its naval defeat by Britain and the West plays a very important role. The second important role is that it wants to maintain access to space. So for instance, if you look at their historical fear, they do not want to have a repeat of what's happening to them in the Malacca Straits, where the presence of the US Navy actually creates a huge obstacle for China's import of oil and energy. And so given the fact that they conceptualize space as profitable in the economic realm of who they are, they want to make sure that they have a very strong presence in space. And they also want to become a very important player in terms of articulating the rules for international space commerce. So this they take from their example of the Outer Space Treaty. So if you look at the Outer Space Treaty of 1967, it is very clear that the United States and the USSR played a key role because of their advancement in space technology. And believe me, after 50 years, we are still using the Outer Space Treaty as that core document based on which space law and international politics in space is articulated. So China realizes that if you become an important player in a particular regime, you have to start now. And so for instance, they take example from the nuclear regime where because of the fact that they tested nuclear weapons, they became a part of the NPT regime. So that's the kind of influence as to why China is so much invested in its space technology today. Now, if you look at China's strategic culture, so there are different versions of it. I wouldn't go into detail now, but you know, they have realism, you have legalism, which is basically conceptualized from Han Fei Zi's uh, famous work on legalism in the warring, uh, war period. And so in that particular construct, the state has to be very powerful and it has to be led by a very strong political leader. And President Xi, when he became president in 2013, basically was influenced by this particular doctrine. But they also have the concept of surface harmony. They have a concept of globalism, which they want to articulate for their space program. But there is a tension between the importance of national interests and the importance of uh, global commons, which some of their space scientists articulate space is. So uh, how China conceptualizes space and the resources it has is very much dependent on its historical folklore, its myth, its uh, texts, and also its contemporary power in terms of economic and military power in the world. And so uh, based on that, so these are some of China's uh, space uh, you know, capacities, what are they focusing on? First, they're focusing on possessing the capacity to send humans to, uh, to, uh, to low Earth orbit. 
they want to uh, very much dominate cislunar space, which is the space between the Earth and the Moon. And in the next slide, I'll show you what I mean. They have invested in anti-satellite weapon. Remember what I told you in the beginning? Societies are dependent on space for almost everything. Our farmers depend on space for weather patterns. You know, our military depends on space for movement and navigation. You cannot even think of deployment in the China-India border if you do not have a good satellite command and control system. And so China has invested in an anti-satellite capability and is improving it so that it creates vulnerabilities for, say, a competitor in, in international politics geopolitically. So they're investing in a permanent space station to develop permanent space capacity. They have invested in a Mars mission, and they also want to invest in deep space capacity. So if you look at their long-term goals, they are actually thinking for the next 50 years, unlike say India or the US, which thinks about the next five years. And I think that's because unlike the US and India, or for instance, the UK, where you have a democratic government and there is a change in uh, political administration every four or five years, in China, President Xi and the Communist Party of China is actually there for life. And so their capability to invest in technologies like space-based solar power, lunar and asteroid mining, military space capacity is very much dependent on their ability to focus on long-term goals. And their key goal is to become the most dominant space power by 2049. So if you look at China's focus on the moon, this is why. This chart will tell you why China wants to focus on its lunar capacity. So if you look at this chart, this is the area, the, the moon is about 400,000 kilometers away from Earth. But if you want to access the moon, and if you want to access the strategic resources that the moon has, if you dominate this particular area, you are actually ahead. And that's what China is focusing on today. It's cis lunar presence so that it does not, as I said, have to suffer from a US space force becoming the most important power. And the second reason is that if you launch from Earth, the gravity well of the Earth is 22 times more. That means that you need more fuel and it's very expensive to launch from Earth. But if you're able to launch from the moon, the gravity well is actually much, much lesser. So you can see from this chart. So if you launch from here, you, net, you need less fuel. And that's what they're actually building towards. They want to build a, a moon base by 2036. And they've already launched a mission to the far side of the moon in 2019. Now, uh, I wouldn't repeat this, but one of the main leaders of their space program says that China would begin to exploit the moon Earth space for industrial development. And you see, they also connect their space development and ambitions to the national rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. So it's very directly connected to their influence in international politics. My last few slides will talk about how they're building the capacity. So it's not just about rhetorical arguments or ambitions. They're actually investing in space capacity in the long term. So if you see this particular uh, slide, this is about their lunar simulation base that they actually already accomplished in 2019 successfully. A few of their scientists and students stayed in a lunar-like environment for one year and actually developed a self-sustaining lab. And so, and this is humanity's first, uh, you know, exploration of actually having a cotton seed sprout on the lunar surface for long-term human settlement goals. And the Chang'e 4 carried this 3 kg bio regenerative life support system. And so again, uh, just again to reiterate, it's uh, basically about low earth orbit. It's about cis lunar space and the moon. Now we know that very, uh, China actually is launching to Mars. So we know India is the first Asian nation to launch an orbiter to Mars. But China actually is launching an orbiter, a lander, uh, and a rover to Mars in their very first attempt. Of course, again, to showcase to their own people, and especially in a COVID-19 context, where the Communist Party of China is suffering from legitimacy problems, to showcase their technological prowess, and to also showcase to the US, and I'm sure their target audience is the US and India, that they are equally capable, and are capable of going much further than the US and India. Now, civilian space capacity, uh, finally, I'll, I'll say that China's space capacity is advanced. They are uh, investing in a very uh, heavy lift rocket. So as I said before, the most important thing for humanity to be able to go to space is their ability to launch and payload capacity. So till now, we have good capacity from Falcon 9, which is a SpaceX rocket from the US. 
But China is also investing in the Long March 9, which is able to take about 140 metric ton to low Earth orbit and 50 ton to space moon lunar transfer orbit. So they're actually investing in capacity and demonstrating that capacity. Now, this is of concern to international relations as we speak today, including the China-India border conflict. I don't see this kind of analysis coming out very regularly, but I think it's very critical we realize this. So China has invested heavily in military space capacity. They have ground-based laser systems, so they can actually block. An example could be US military's command and control. They can block that if they want. The Indian military's command and control, they can block that. They can block an eye looking at the Galwan Valley, for instance, and, and make it difficult for Indian troops to get to a particular area. And they can deploy their own missiles and their own aircrafts based on that kind of support system. And you can see that they have also established a separate People's Liberation Army Space Force uh, in 2015 to kind of bring together the space capacities. So again, just to reiterate, they are military dominated, unlike India and the US, where their space programs are more civilian. Uh, but China's space program has come out of the People's Liberation Army and continues to be military dominated. And what is so interesting is that President Xi connects space to the Belt and Road Initiative. So for them, it is very important to use space as a diplomatic tool to create influence and to include other countries in offering their space capacity. And as we all know, the Baidu navigation system is independent now, and that's actually a big deal. So if you want to have influence in international politics today, it's very important for you to have independent command and control and independent navigation system. And in May 2020, China accomplished that goal by launching the 55th satellite of their own that established a completely independent command and control. So now they are not dependent on a US GPS. They have their own navigation system for their own society and their own military. Navi so, quick. Yeah. yeah, just in a minute. And so uh, they also are investing in a new space capacity. So unlike the US, they have very accomplished uh, new space organizations, which are not state funded. But I would caveat that by saying that some of China's new space agencies have huge state funding. And so some of the scenarios for conflict, I would say, is that if you think about a, an area on the moon, for instance, the South Pole, where India tried to land as well, if China goes there first, which is part of their strategic culture that first presence really matters, they might actually establish a zone of non-interference, and then you might then have to take permission from them to land in a particular area. And so th the problem is that we still do not have space law that actually offers us a dispute resolution mechanism. So finally, I would say that for China, space is a very important part of their grand strategy and their international relations identity. They are investing in space uh, like no other country. They're investing in very long-term space uh, technologies. Uh, they want to use their space uh, capacity to become an important player by 2049. And I think from my perspective, given the fact that I look at strategic futures, the, re the reason I want to study this particular area is that when I looked at China's past deadlines for their space goals to include the landing on the far side of the moon, they actually accomplish every single space goal they set 10 years back on time. And that's, I think I'll end with that and tell you that it's really critical and significant we realize how much they're investing in space in terms of their international identity as a great power. So Smriti, I'll end there and thank you. Thank you, uh, Namrata. I think it was a very, very interesting presentation on a topic which not many people uh, know about. And when uh, China's, uh, you know, is emerging as a global power and many also think that it is going to replace uh, United States in the future. Of course, it is something which is one is debating. I think technology plays a very significant role. And that is where probably till now, uh, United States has scored much more, you know, in terms of technology. Uh, but uh, China coming to the space probably will, op will open up, uh, you know, much more, um, you know, there is this talk about whether it will lead to a kind of militarization of outer space, you know, those kind of debates are coming in. But we'll get uh, into all those uh, perhaps uh, during the Q&A and as the organizer says, uh, we have to complete the presentation first. Uh, 
second uh, presenter is uh, Subra Chaturvedi. She is a research fellow in NICE and she is going to speak on India's rise as a global power in the post COVID-19 era. Prospects in a nuclear neighborhood. Over to you, Subra. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm sorry for the delay, some technical glitch. I'm really sorry. So I'm going to discuss the rise of uh, Indian state as a global power in the post-COVID-19 scenario, looking at the nuclear neighborhood and the dynamics that is really important to keep in mind right now. The reasons behind taking this topic are one, India is one of the strongest links between the Western countries and South Asia, more so in the current mood when the attempts are to contain or check China. Secondly, the current nuclear norms order seems very rickety. The talks between, um, sorry, there are requests coming to me. I'm sorry, there are requests coming to me. Anyways, um, the talks between the United States and Russia that were held on 22nd June to discuss the future prospects of arms control and nuclear disarmament did not have anything conclusive or substantial to convey. There are, of course, going to be follow-up meetings, but the New START Treaty is going to expire in February 2021. So in the current scenario, what are the factors that can make place for India amongst other potential candidates? First, the dismal situation of nuclear norms order. Soon after the advent of nuclear weapons, there was a tussle between the custodians of nuclear weapons technology who wanted to uh, sort of build a mechanism or an infrastructure to prevent the horizontal proliferation. A major challenge in that was that though the intentions were the same, there was a mutual lack of trust. There was no confidence between United States and the then Soviet Union. So there was a constant looking for exceptionalism by both the superpowers, whether it was the Baruch plan of 1940s, the atomic, the Atoms for Peace program, or if you look at the recent examples, the American withdrawal from the Open Skies Treaty, the Russian release of its policy paper, which suddenly emphasizes on the importance of deterrence. These are all indicators that these states that is United States and Russia do not have any confidence in the global mechanism's capability to check the other. The Indian uh, position in this place has been, in this scenario has been interesting because as a participant, it has always been an active one, whether it was uh, an outcrier, um, you know, kind of talking against the discriminations, the nuclear apartheid that existed, whether it was the critique or whether now that it's an advocate of the nuclear disarmament. India has always been a nuclear power with a voice or a nuclear power aspirant with a voice. The second interesting uh, development has been the talks of nuclear tests, which have led to a sort of uneasiness. Although US and China are both signatories of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty since 1996, there have been observations that whether it is the United States or Russia, in fact, um, recently there were talks of, uh, there were reports that came out that China had gone ahead with a low yield nuclear test at their testing site. I think about two weeks ago, the American administration came out hinting, considering nuclear tests after 28 years suddenly. All these suggest that there is a crippling happening of the basic uh, world order. And it is also weakening the importance of deterrence that existed all these years. India, on the other hand, has maintained a voluntary moratorium on nuclear testing. It has an impeccable proliferation record it has its no first use policy right in place. And as a core feature of its nuclear doctrine emerges the nuclear minimalism, which is when you give more importance to the political relevance. It does understand the technological relevance as well, but minimal use. Despite being at almost half 
in the number of nuclear warheads as compared to China. India is working on its naval, naval component and it has a fairly strong air component. Now, if we were to believe that the world is moving towards the multilateralism, then uh, let's look at how the dynamics has been played. Since the announcement made by the World Health Organization about China being the source of the COVID-19 virus, there has been a tension. US and the allies have been involved in blaming China for covering up the initial period, the covering up the virus in the initial period, which definitely resulted in it being spread majorly to other parts of the world. Alliances like Quad Plus or the Democratic 10, they've all have, they all have a covert tone of checking the Chinese rice. India figures in all of them. In addition to that, India is slowly working at rekindling the spirit of non-aligned movement, pitching up for emergency funds for the SARC to overcome this sort of crisis. I think it's 10 million US dollars or something, that amount, to help the SARC countries come out of it. India obviously has uh, investments in a lot of South Asian countries, whether it's Afghanistan, Myanmar, most of the South Asian countries. In fact, the Indian partnerships with China in the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, or if um, it's the Shanghai Cooperation Organization in the new banks, which have come under BRICS, everything speaks of Indian presence, even economically. This I have mentioned because there have been a lot of arguments that the nuclear power will not emerge if it is economically insufficient but Indian economic presence is not something that can be ignored easily. So if we look at the Indian image right now, it is of a nuclear power with nuclear restraint that has been tested time and again, whether it's the Kargil war or the Bombay attacks, India has displayed its nuclear restraint. It is a benevolent power practicing health diplomacy, staying, staying away from incorrect nuclear signaling not saying that we are going to go ahead with nuclear tests or use or anything like that, has supplied medical aid and help to a lot of countries. I think it's supplied the hydrochloro, we mean to more than uh, 50 countries. It has sent medical aid and help to Maldives, Kuwait, Sri Lanka, a lot of countries. And they, all this has happened in the midst of situations like a standoff, a border standoff with China. So the rationality is still in its place. Yet realistically, there are many challenges. Like E.T. Abraham pointed out, that India needs to overcome uh, its domestic issues like poverty, gender violence, economic insecurity, religious conflicts to rise up as a global power. Secondly, India is not on, a, on cordial terms with its immediate nuclear neighbors, China and Pakistan. There are issues with Nepal, there are migrancy concerns with Bangladesh, and so on. Despite all the applause, the Indian policy of no first use has often been criticized as being just a tool for hypocrisy or a very calculative strategy of dual behavior. Moreover, the Indian nuclear doctrine does have exceptions when that NFU can be overlooked. Most importantly, India enjoyed a sort of nuclear exceptionalism. It may be because of its impeccable proliferation record, but still, because of that exceptionalism, it became a precedent for other states to follow up and demand more things. In fact, uh, when India got signed the deal with America, there were a lot of cries of discrimination from China as well as Pakistan. So what is the verdict then? I think uh, in a tussle between nuclear responsibility versus nuclear capability, responsibility will prevail. India has come out of its soft state syndrome, which according to the former foreign secretary, Nirupama Rao, was a result of the unwillingness to act firmly. The Balakot strike and the official statement which was issued by the Indian government were evidence of a change in the Indian policy. Not anymore um, 
India did not um, continue to sort of uh, divulge around issues, but gave a proper statement that yes, this was condemned. A shift towards multilateralism works in Indian favor with its unintentional geographic placement just next to China. Its nuclear capability works as a deterrence as well as a confidence booster for the Western countries. The current scenario when the American leadership is being questioned translates to US reaching out to its allies, especially till November. More, the elections are due in November. India is in a great place for that. The Indian democratic model is also, although it's open for discussion how democratic it is, but it is an asset in the current scenario. In conclusion, India has literally emerged as the avenger for America to recapture its image. Its belief in independence and sovereignty and its right decisions at the right time will work in its favor. And India will emerge as a global power in the post COVID-19 considering the relevance of deterrence that is emerging now. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Subra. That was a very, uh, you know, comprehensive presentation in terms of within 12 minutes, you were able to capture not just the nuclear revelry, but also, you know, India's role in the global politics and how India is moving, uh, not just being a nuclear power, but being a responsible nuclear power and also at the same time having uh, uh, trying to have the economic capacity, you know, to influence uh, decisions. I completely agree with you that uh, perhaps, uh, you know, the dual behavior which you uh, presented is some of the criticism which has come, uh, you know, uh, regarding India's behavior. Uh, one of the things probably which just comes to my mind, you know, we can take it during the Q&A uh, session is this, the presence of the tactical nuclear weapon. And this is something which is being uh, discussed. Uh, and there are certain, um, you know, the... American, I think one of the journal I'm forgetting, uh, had mentioned that Pakistan has much more of strategic, uh, you know, tactical strategic weapons. And that is where, you know, this entire thing about uh, behaving responsibly and all this thing comes about. Uh, but I think uh, because of the U.S. Uh, initiative, Pakistan now has uh, a robust command structure in place because there is this fear of, you know, uh, weapon falling uh, to the hand of a uh, terrorist. Uh, so these are some of the issues. I think India is also, in a sense, you know, when you spoke about that India had a voice, and perhaps India was adhering to some kind of norms, because unless until uh, you try and, uh, you know, in a sense, uh, adhere to certain norms, it becomes very difficult because, you know, then the entire thing of governance comes into picture internationally uh, when one speaks of uh, responsibility and non-responsibility. Now we'll move to the third speaker, speaker, Dr. Swasti Rao, who is assistant professor in Aligarh Muslim University. Uh, she's going to speak on uh, hybridity of economic diplomacy and strategic coercion. And in this context, she's going to speak about Chinese development of the PLA Navy and its, uh, you know, anti-piracy uh, mission. And I'm sure this is going to be very, very interesting as PLA moves to the Indian Ocean and mostly in terms of the anti-piracy kind of operation. Over to you, Swati. Sorry, I missed, <laughs> I made a mistake, Swasti. Yeah, I'm Swasti. No, it's okay. <laughs> so thank you so much. So, uh, well, I think you've already set the stage. Uh, first of all, let me just thank uh, my dear friend, Pramod, and all the wonderful, for all, uh, you know, the wonderful presentations made here to NICE and to the, the staff, which is working relentlessly. So I'm sure, you know, they have really impressed us big time. So uh, with that, yes, uh, I am going to be talking about, you know, the plans uh, modernization. And, you know, why am I doing this now? Is that because uh, what we've realized is that, you know, uh, we need to understand China better. You know? So all, all these efforts that were being made you know, by, by our policy makers somewhere are now being criticized that we do not understand China uh, you know, um, well enough, which is that China is not really adhering to any established rules of the game. And the, the presentation that I'm doing for you today is specifically focusing on this side of a, you know, evolve, how 
a particular component uh, in China's policy kind of evolved and then widened its scope and uh, and thereon got to achieving what it has achieved, etc. So it has all come from this frustration that we need to understand China better. So, uh, like I said, so no big power in the run-up uh, to the top slot of a global hegemon adheres to the established rules of engagement. They create their own rules, and it is up to the rest of the world to then decode what those rules are, how they get developed, how they are executed, and what they exactly wish to achieve. Often, when talking about China, this out-of-the-box thinking is what is absolutely the need of the hour, so that we whether while developing our policies or whether doing research can look through uh, what benefit is to be given to China. And this becomes easier in the light of the obscure hints that China drops all over the world. So what I'm presenting today becomes all the more important in the light of how adeptly and discreetly China ventures into the gray overlapping zones as and when required to engage with the choke points, problems they have, and various other challenges and preparations regarding the BRI expansion. Um, the background to this thing is that far from what the Chinese might like us to believe, they are a fairly disturbed nation under a totalitarian CCP rule. And the difficulties faced by the communist ideology in China have constrained the CCP to base their legitimacy in the twin pillars of economic performance and nationalism. So, uh, well, you know, it's great that I am uh, kind of addressing such an erudite audience who are pretty much, uh, you know, in know-how of the Chinese uh, nitty-gritty. So I can directly come to uh, the main point of my argument, which is that so that now that we know that economic performance is a matter of regime survival for China, so then let me take you to an interesting but an obscure correlation between this desideratum and the modernization of the plan. So uh, today, I thought of focusing on this intertwining of Chinese Navy modernization with economic factors. And while it is pretty obvious, but how they went about it is where the interesting bit lies. So, um, so we would, so like I said, that it's, it's pretty clear that they did that and they, they wanted to protect their economic interests abroad, but not in the way that we might think it was. So at different platforms, uh, while discussing China, China is all over the place these days, I have made the argument that China is the champion of the proxy. And it is this nature that I'm interested in bringing to light today. So what is the most important component that counts for 90% of China's imports and exports, which ensure their economic development? The answer is their maritime commerce. And in addition to this, Chinese economic growth heavily relies on imported natural resources, especially oil, and this dependence is likely to keep increasing. And therefore, you know, we have all this phenomena of Chinese um, economic imperialism in Africa, etc. So hence, it is the security of the slots, which is the sea lines of communication, which provide access to Europe and to the Middle East, which has become very crucial in ensuring China's stability. But the problem with the slots is the number of choke points, like, you know, we all know. That has made Beijing very concerned about the security of its uninterrupted flow of energy, ore, and food. Protection of the choke point is where the Chinese economic vulnerability lies. And that has been a subject of credible uh, research in recent times. So in this context, plan then, the People's Liberation Army Navy, has positioned itself as the protector of Chinese economy. And as a growing power, China sees its navy as the instrument of statecraft through port visits and deployments. And of course, we are seeing this entire uh, you know, power play happening in South China Sea, etc. So Beijing is using plan as a tool to protect its economic interests by protecting the slots and helping realize the grand vision of the BRI, right? The question is, how and under what pretext has the Chinese modernized their plan? Why is this interesting? Because China has never had a war at sea in recent times, in modern times. So how does China maintain a world-class navy, maintain and increase their combat readiness in the absence of any classic combat or a war scenario whatsoever? And then, you know, the Chinese have to protect their extensive coastlines running in about 32,000 kilometers, where its main industrial cities and harbors are situated. And of course, they also bear in mind that the century of humiliation was made possible because China was unable to protect their shores. So basically, what I want to say is that while it's clear that maintaining a powerful navy is important, but 
as to how the Chinese have actually done it is where the interesting book lies. For the answer, let us analyze what I've brought here is that I've analyzed the Hu Jintao with the Xi Jinping uh, regimes, and something interesting has come out. Now, in the Hu Jintao period, two main characteristics could be seen. One was the focus on military operations other than war, which is known as moot, uh, which basically mean, uh, you know, um, peacekeeping and anti-piracy, disaster relief, medical support, counter-terrorism. So those missions serve as the Chinese narrative of a responsible stakeholder. And for the first time that emerged in the Hu Jintao period, it was 2002 to 2012. And later that became a tool of the statecraft. And the second important characteristic in the Hu Jintao period was that there was a shift from their near seat to far seat. So uh, in short, basically it means the evolution of the modernization of the plan in achieving and enhancing blue water capability with the clear intention of having overseas bases. So China acquiring these overseas bases is not a surprise because as early as 2000 and 2010, scholars were suggesting working that the, the Chinese intentions of building up a blue water navy would be culminating in the acquisition of overseas bases, right? So, which actually happened in 2017 with their first base coming up the Djibouti. Fine, so now coming, I mentioned the, uh, you know, the Hu Jintao period. So, and in the Xi Jinping period, which starts from 2012, we saw an acceleration in this modernization program of plan, which the, there was a lot of urge, you know, um, you know, urging uh, the plan to sharpen their combat readiness to fight and win the next war. But the thing is that how do you do it when there is no war happening? So, and you know, uh, this this particular thing is very clear uh, when if, if you if you analyze the two defense papers, the important defense papers of 2012 and 2015, where it is very clear that China's strategic thinking, maritime domain, is increasing in China's strategic thinking, and. Uh, Beijing is also considering that the most likely conflict scenario will occur at sea. And we now know, you know, East China Sea, there's a, East, East China sea, there's a problem, South China Sea, there's a problem, you know, um, uh, so like that. Uh, and in, the, in 2015, uh, again, there was a shift from a focus on offshore water defense to open seas. So, you know, like that. And the other thing that tells us why uh, the maritime domain uh, became so important for Xi was definitely the DRI. You know? So this is key to understanding the development of the maritime uh, you know, silk road, which represents the most vital slots for China. And, uh, and hence their active efforts to develop a strategic and economic relationship along the MSR, right? And, uh, you know, so that they could balance the pivot to Asia and, you know, the Asia Reassurance Initiative as under Trump. So it's like that, and it's, it's pretty clear. Now, let me explain as to how anti-piracy mission has helped India you know. And there's great work done by Andrew Erickson, and you know the book is out there, so it's, it's great. It's very interesting. So um, from there, you know, you know, we get to see that anti-piracy operations have, uh, especially in the Horn of Africa, off the coast of Somalia, is where this entire thing starts to unfold. Because in Somalia, in the background of a lack of a stable government, uh, piracy started to develop, you know, in the early 2000s. So much so that the United Nations Security Council adopted a resolution in June of 2008. It was resolution number 1816, condemning the piracy. And then this was followed by a string of resolutions, 1838, 1846, 1851. And basically, the United Nations Security, uh, you know, was requesting the nations to come, come ahead and fight in the high seas uh, of Somalia. And we got certain responses from EU. They responded with Operation Atlanta, NATO with Ocean Shield, US-led combined uh, maritime forces, Japan, Russia, South Korea, even India. They all participated independently. But so far, we don't see a mention of China. So, as a, so what I'm saying is that Abhi, there's, there's no China right now there. But as a result of all these engagements, uh, because of the United Nations uh, Security Council resolutions, piracy is almost completely wiped out. You know, uh, by 2012, while, uh, you know, about 176 attacks were recorded in 2011, only 35 in 2012, and literally zero in 2015. So what was the role of China? So let us now shift focus to China and see what they are doing. Let us deconstruct this phenomenon. So what they're doing is that they are, uh, they, China uh, started to participate uh, in December of 2008 only after Chinese vessels were attacked, okay? And the plan 
they they uh, they started responding but uh, they they responded not in coalition with others with the already present powers they started responding unilaterally okay now we need to deconstruct this the, the first escort mission by plan is getting launched in january 2009 okay because the attack is happening 2008 uh, december and by 2015 the number of escort mission deployment is reaching 20 and by the April of 2019, which is last year, this number is reaching 32. The question is that why do we see so many uh, deployments when there is no piracy happening there, right? So this is the interesting catch: is that despite piracy being contained, the plan continues to be present in these regions, and the number of Chinese deployments continue to grow. Even now, you know, if you were to go to Gulf of Aden, which is that area, you will see, uh, you know, the the Jiangai frigate. Which is usually uh, done for these escorts, right? So then, what is the justification? So now, plan more readily gets aligned. Next, and now they are more experienced for the move to operations. But anti-piracy missions are no longer the main focus of these escorts. So piracy in the Gulf of Aden has simply become a justification for the deployment of ships in this key area of China's economy. So what are we getting to now? If not piracy, then what are the other objectives of plan? How are they getting played out? So. You know, you will get about three, four main objectives of uh, you know plan um, plans presence uh, there. So one thing is that a lot of scholars have compared this anti-piracy mission uh, in terms of a springboard for China to expand their maritime security operations. So, for example, they enable participation. I think you need to wind up within okay, a minute. Right. Have okay, completed twelve minutes. So, all right, thank you. Up. So, so this is what they're doing, and what they're doing is that, and then related phenomena there is the presence of Chinese peacekeepers who help in this, and ultimately this all gets culminated in the high point of Djibouti, where because after having a base in Djibouti, they can very easily uh, take care of the you know. The Gulf of uh, you know Aden, the Babel Mandeb choke point, the Red Sea, the Persian Gulf, East Africa, etc. So this was what I was wanting to uh, you know um, that how this has become a hybrid project which works in collaboration and protecting other Chinese economic interests. It did not start off like that, but it kind of changed its flavor, and uh, this is what uh, I found interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Swasti, and it was. Uh... Uh, very very interesting presentation in terms of the manner in which uh, the plan has uh, expanded its uh, you know its operation uh, from uh, not being you know just being a brown water navy it has moved to be a blue water navy has acquired bases and there is this talk about uh, you know uh, about the string of pearls which one often keep on hearing of course china has acquired the capacity of uh, out of area operation because i i think unless until you have that capacity it's very difficult to move out from your uh, shore and do the kind of operation which is uh, doing of course the new thing which is uh, has come about and many of the navies are engaged in uh, is the humanitarian assistance and disaster relief and that has become a major thing uh, including of course the anti piracy as you said has almost a start very interesting presentation and thank you so much uh, let us move to our um, fourth speaker dr jivanta uh, jivanta she is going to she's teaching in uh, dublin uh, in, in, in uh, dublin and she is going to speak on very very current topic that is india's ongoing border dispute with china and domestic and international compulsion and very timely and very topical and uh, looking forward to listen to you jivanta over to you okay thank you very much dr patnaik and also to the organizers and to all the colleagues uh, who are present it's a pleasure to be part of this so yes i guess some of you might ask why take on this topic especially as it's currently unfolding be still before our eyes um with all the negotiations that are still going on to um Oh thank you for putting up the uh, presentation it's just a short powerpoint but um given that uh, the crisis is still in the process of um, disengagement it hasn't even reached the phase of deescalation but um i think when you study and i teach indian foreign policy india china relations is is probably the most complicated difficult question to discuss theoretically as well as empirically of course the other relationships in the region are equally complicated um and and important but i feel often that 
a lot more attention has been given to say, for example, the India-Pakistan conflict um, from a theoretical and uh, sort of foreign policy studies perspective. Whereas the India-China question often gets um, submerged within bigger issues of the ongoing civilizational rivalry, a big geopolitical rivalry, the great power competition. And it kind of tends to overlook perhaps a more foreign policy making perspective on um, very specific issues. And probably the border is, of course, in my view, one of the biggest issues then to take issue with. And one of the most fascinating aspects of foreign policy in the region and of India. Now, in the literature, the border tends to get described or analyzed in many different ways, either as part of the problem between India and China or as a symptom of the overall rivalry between India and China. But I think it's also interesting to look at it as an instrument itself of um, the policies on both sides uh, towards each other. So just in preparing for this, and this is, this is probably quite rudimentary, um, I was just brainstorming as to what makes this such a fascinating case study. I mean, first of all, we've had negotiations going on since 1981. And even though some innovative ideas seem to come up occasionally, it just doesn't seem to go anywhere in terms of actually talking seriously about resolving um, the border problem. And the problem is that it's not just about, it's about significant pieces of territory. I mean, huge pieces of territory and it's about delineating a boundary. So it hasn't even reached the point where the two sides actually agree on where on certain sectors where the boundary actually is. So, I mean, that's a major step to get to before you can actually then reach the process of, um, of, of, of discussing the border. And then just following the media in the recent um, phase with the, the tragic uh, developments in, in uh, the Galwan Valley and in Ladakh, I think often there is a confusion, right, to equate the LAC with the LOC. So people just think it's the same situation. And the ambiguity that exists on the ground with the LAC, especially in the Western sector where the recent events took place is just so ambiguous that um, I think that needs to be emphasized much more. I mean, the LOC emerged from a ceasefire that was negotiated by the UN. It was designated on paper at the Shimla Agreement. It's been delineated on a map which has been exchanged and signed by the both sides. And none of that has actually happened with regards to the LAC, I would say on as the LSE as a whole, but specifically also mostly on the Western sector, which is one of the most um, disputed sectors. The other difference between the LOC and the LAC is, of course, that the border between India and China is not physically manned constantly. So it has these moving um, physical markers, which also then generate confusion as to where forces are at a particular time and have they actually intruded or not. And then it just boils down to the mind boggling fact. And of course, to this audience that might not be so surprising, they might all be aware of that. But when I speak to Europeans or when I speak to students here, the fact that China considers the border to be 2000 kilometers, India considers the border to be 3488 kilometers. That's a huge discrepancy. Um, so there's a huge 1488 kilometers that is under dispute and is not figuring um, in each other's discussions. And that is where Aksai Chin, of course, comes in and where the recent standoff and casualties have taken place. Now, the other interesting thing, of course, about the whole discussion is that the border has been enmeshed with state building and security interests right from the start. My own more rather earlier research was on the Panchashila agreement. And I mean, that highlights perfectly how deeply integrated state building was with foreign policy in the early 50s, both on India's side and on China's side, and the contradictions that emerged as a result, as a result of being a post-colonial state that inherited colonial boundaries and how to resolve that inherent contradiction. So not to take sides, as that's a huge quagmire in itself, as who was to blame for, say, in the Chini Bhai Bhai, the 54 agreement, the 62 war, who is to take credit, who is to be blamed. But the point is that both India and China um, interpreted their borders in very particular ways due to their state building um, agendas. And security interests have also evolved with time, thanks to military upgrades, technology, which we've just listened to, infrastructural investments, which have been very important, of course, mostly on the Chinese side, but increasingly on the Indian side, 
and wider geopolitical dynamics, which brings me to this final point on this slide, is that we're talking about two major countries, two major powers, although India, of course, is always reminded that it's only 20% of China's GDP, but still two major countries with major ambitions and therefore who have long-term both internal and external balancing strategies. So that those are all the factors which point to this dispute being probably one of the most important disputes, I would say, of the 21st century. Okay, if we could move to the next slide. I don't know if I'm in control of that. Thank you very much. Um, so then if one comes to the current developments, um, again, it's an evolving situation, but I think there are various aspects which come out which have probably surprised everybody. I mean, whether it's the strategic analysts, whether it's the academics, whether it's um, the general public. And I think it's honed people's attention onto what is at stake and what are the problems in resolving this dispute. So first of all, the timing, which I think everyone is still discussing as to what was the, the, the reasons for these, oh, sorry, if you could stay on the previous slide, what was the reasons for this outbreak to happen at this particular moment in time, considering that both countries have been going through a very difficult time with COVID-19. And then interestingly, the fact that this outbreak of violence happened despite ongoing talks and meetings. So there were discussions, I mean, the, the scuffles, the standoffs occurred in early May, and there were diplomatic consultations, there were military officer meetings, there was a senior corps commander level meeting on June the 6th, and even a consensus that was reached on the June 6th meeting. And nevertheless, this um, uh, set of events then escalated into what was brutal violence um, um, in mid-June. So uh, this, this incongruence is also extremely puzzling as to how did it get out of control despite these talks going on. Then I think the other interesting thing that is coming out as we witness this process is the complex, and somehow I don't feel it was as much in the spotlight with past um, border incidents, this complex process of disengagement leading on to de-escalation. De so we see now that it's, it's a very tricky process um, involving multiple levels and different actors to try and um, get disengagement happening on the ground, which then has to be verified. And de-escalation de comes at a later stage. I think we all assume that we've reached a standoff and then we move to de-escalation, but we're actually still in quite a tricky phase before we even get to de-escalation. Um, and so the final point on this slide is that from my point of view, sorry, the pre yeah, we'll lead into this uh, final slide, is that we definitely see an assertiveness in India's position. And I think the assertiveness is evident in India's stance it has taken on the negotiations in the last couple of weeks that it wants a return to the April status quo before this um, situation escalated. So in terms of where the positions will be agreed upon and the disengagement in the various um, position points. Um, so the toughness or the assertiveness comes through in terms of the demands, but also in terms of the issues, because it's, it's a very complicated um, situation. And in terms of the partners. So India is dealing with a very tough negotiation partner on the other side. And I think it's well known that China is good at letting negotiations go on and on to whittle you down, but also the particular commanders who are involved have a prehistory when it comes to also Doklam and so on. So India knows that it's dealing with, you know, a, a very difficult um, partner on the other side. And then of course, being the Western sector, which is in any case far more complicated in many ways, some would say compared to the other parts of the border. So how do we understand, and now we could come to the final slide, how do we understand this choice of assertion? Now, this again is a rather fanciful diagram and by no means um, sort of uh, representative of, of reality. But if we just boil it down very sort of minimally to what are the options that a country has in, in especially a crisis situation. And I think we could see that at different points in the way India has dealt with um, the border uh, tensions, going from appeasement to assertion, and in some ways, some might say a aggressive position, say in the 1962 with the forward policy. So to understand this decision or this um, choice, let's not forget it's a choice to take an assertive position. 
Um, this diagram might be helpful in terms of looking at the different variables um, and levels at stake. So of course we have the decision maker at the heart of it all, who's the mediator between the domestic and the international level. And there of course we have the BJP and the Narendra Modi factor and the abrogation of Article 370, which had implications for the creation of Ladakh and therefore on the border. Um, but interestingly, I think the diagram can also remind us that this is not a linear process. So when we think about the current incident in terms of the bigger picture of the history of this problem, it's not a linear process. It's a nonlinear process. And partly because if you can see um, at the bottom of the diagram, this idea of a feedback loop. So every incident feeds back into this process with then a certain memory, a certain learning, maybe a disintegration or a institutionalization of trust. Um, and then the other thing perhaps that the diagram helps keep in mind is that we have a path dependency effect working through history and memory, but also contingency effects with things that are changing constantly in terms of the international as well as domestic context. So finally, just to come to a conclusion, I would also like to put forward the fact that ambiguity has been a very useful tactic or strategy for both India and China on the border. It has served maybe both sides purposes to keep the border ambiguous. I mean, India also has not put forward an official map, say, of its claims on certain parts of the LAC. So there's also a reason behind a reasoning behind that. And for China, I think it's also been quite convenient to let this problem simmer as opposed to resolve it. Um, but as I've already mentioned, in this current situation, India has shown a certain firmness and assertiveness. And I think if we use this diagram to contextualize the current case in relation to all the past cases, one could then discuss this, ass this assertiveness, which might have been there in the past. But I think the difference now is that it's backed up by a coordinated and coherent um, strategy both at the domestic and the international and the institutional level, which brings in an interesting qualitative and quantitative difference in the way India is responding currently. So finally, I would put forward the point that um, the border in all the analyses one makes of India-China relations has to be put at the forefront of this relationship. I think there was in a lot of the agreements signed between these two countries, a concerted effort to put the border in fact on the back burner um, and get on with other things. But I mean, the fact that this is a big border and a hugely uh, contested, I mean, they don't even agree on what the LAC is in some sectors, means that it cannot be sidelined or overlooked, um, especially after what we've seen recently. So I'll end there. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Jibanta. That was a very interesting presentation in terms of, you know, uh, how how and why India has been aggressive in particular points, though um, there are also this, uh, as you said, you know, on one side you have 2,000 uh, kilometer border and on the other side it is more than 3,000 kilometers. So there is a, a big gap between the two countries' perception. And uh, if I remember it uh, correctly, at one point of time, uh, the two countries had spoken about to exchange the map regarding their own perception. Uh, it seems India did and China has not done it. So there, uh, you know, it was a kind of, you know, how to guard the border in spite of having, it, you know, taking into account each other's perception. I think uh, probably that is uh, something which is difficult. Of course, there is this debate about the China, which has so resolved its boundary almost with all the countries except for India and Bhutan, which has again got linked. Uh, has something to do with a larger contestation, not just, uh, you know, within, within Asia. I'm not going to the, even to the global sphere. And these are very interesting. And uh, also at the same time, uh, I would say that please keep on looking at some of the questions which are coming up uh, on the chat uh, box, uh, though I'm also taking note. Now let us move to the next speaker, uh, Dr. Bagisa. Suman, who is assistant professor in Magadh University, and uh, she is going to speak on international development discourse, uh, historical evolution, and trajectory for the new global order. Uh, over to you, Dr. Bagisha. Thank you so much, the whole team of NICE, for actually providing this platform for uh, women uh, from so much diverse, uh, specialized backgrounds to be uh, taken up together. 
and this whole day has been very intellectually stimulating for all of us and thank you chair uh, dr patnaik for uh, moderating the session so well so uh, i i'll be taking the uh, this topic of international development discourse especially in the context of uh, what has been called as uh, the emergence of the uh, hailed as emergence of the new global order uh, because uh, uh, i think uh, development um, as a term as a something which has been mooted time and again and especially gained prominence since the uh, end of the second world war uh, and emergence of what uh, we uh, also call as the uh, global liberal order and whose crumbling down is being witnessed and uh, hailed by many scholars so development in that uh, context needs to be seen uh, both historically and also uh, in its uh, present context and uh, also because covid 19 has uh, uh, actually uh, uh, you know unfolded uh, uh, problems uh, uh, which fall in the uh, scope of development in a manner which probably we in terms of uh, hailing uh, this covid 19 pandemic in terms of the non traditional security challenge uh, was not actually uh, very much uh, foreseen also neither was it very much anticipated by the international community so i would be basically narrating the uh, inter the the whole discourse surrounding uh, development in a brief manner and also try to normatively uh, position the international development discourse uh, for what is being held again as the future new you know unfolding global order so uh, i'll start in the unprecedented times uh, the world is witnessing in terms of its embroilment into the global pandemic covid-19 for more than 4 months now and having not been able to come with come up with a, a foreseeable end to this devastating phenomenon it's just the immediate concern or goal the whole world is aspiring to achieve the umpteen kinds of distresses that have resurfaced in this times of mounting excruciation for the whole humanity is for everyone to see be it the loss of livelihoods surging unemployment migrant labor problem of migrant laborers and all this being the tip of the iceberg in what is being already accepted as the greatest economic downturn for the world since the great depression 1929 and featuring as the mounting challenges of development across the world while the great depression 1929 had become the intellectual plank to the world in terms of the embedded liberal order uh, a term uh, uh, given by john ruggie uh, that was sought afterwards and has ever since time and again been negotiated slumped backwards in the hands of neocons and renegotiated this pendulum of policies has never been bereft of the politics surrounding the global world order which had been named as the liberal international order the cry for whose crumbling has been at the centerpiece of academic discourse for almost a decade now more emphatically being pronounced by the brexit and trumpian arrival on the international scene in the backdrop of all this this paper aspires to unfold two important debates surrounding uh the world development first to situate the international development discourse across the winding trajectory of its existence and assertion uh secondly to uh, correlate the international development discourse with the international political climate and global order and lastly based on the historical and correlational aspects of international development discourse this paper will try to navigate as to what is in store for this ever relevant development for the humans at this important juncture of history based on its historical and correlational abidingness with the ensuing global order development as a word conjures up images of progress positive change upward social and economic much more which we use this word to suit our purpose in everyday life while studying development within the discipline of international politics it becomes all the more interesting owing to the inevitability of the study of the international circumstances which led to the emergence of development as a field of inquiry in fact as professor jayati ghosh has remarked very well development is not and cannot be sim a simple technocratic or a political process rather it is one that relies on and is characterized by changes in income and asset distribution and therefore depends critically on national and international political 
global economy configuration. Thus, the international political dimension of development is very important and involves not just the tale of the conceptual and ideological evolution of development, but also its impact in the praxis as witnessed around the world over the passing years and its implications on the humankind. The matter with an issue like development becomes all the more intriguing when we actually come to terms with it because there is practically everyone everywhere around us speaking for it and having an opinion about it. That makes it a difficult task to define it. That's why, as Roberts has remarked, that development can be conceived only within an ideological framework. Thus, defining development is a task which cannot be taken out of its political and social value ladenness. Alan Thomas suitably extricates three contemporary meanings of the term development thus. Uh, firstly, as a vision, description, or measure of the state of being of a, de of a desirable society. Secondly, as an historical process of, of uh, social change in which societies are transformed over long periods. And thirdly, as consisting of deliberate efforts aimed at improvement on the part of various agencies, including governments, all kinds of organizations, and social movements. For the purpose of forming an understanding about the concept of development, all these three senses in which development has been implied here are quite pertinent and inclusive. However, in order to develop a better understanding of development, it needs to be examined in a historical, in historically contextual manner. So it is in this third sense of development as consisting of deliberate efforts aimed at improvement on the part of various agencies, including governments, all kinds of organizations, and social movements that it would be dealt here. Development in itself has evolved as a conceptual tool, as a policy prescription, and as the vision to emancipate the world, as a critical tool to understand politics, and as a process which has been undergoing considerable leaps. Development became popularized on the international level in the context of the post-Second World War efforts of the superpowers to set ideals for the rest of the world to follow their footprint and achieve what they had in terms of economic growth, na high national and per capita income, and modern industrialized societies. Thus, some scholars trace the foundation of development as a modern inventiveness in the 1940s with the deliberate aim on the part of the world powers of the time to make the other countries of the world to their line in terms of the path they had followed. This was a time period marked by two important phenomena in the world history. Firstly, the decolonization of the many African and Asian countries, which were facing the daunting task of nation building and meeting the myriad challenges of their national economies in terms of poverty, unemployment, low productivity and growth. And secondly, the ideological divide of capitalism and socialism of the Cold War era, where both the US and the USSR camp were trying to attract more and more third world and decolonized uh, countries to their camp. These two ideologies, though apart in terms of the means to achieve the end of development, basically had the similar type of vision to who the allies in the third world, while the US-led capitalist Western camp believed in the path of liberal economic growth, the USSR-inspired socialist camp made, uh, made centralized planning based uh, economic system as the driver for the high and rapid economic growth and industrialization, which formed the basis for the conception of development in those times. The historic point in the discourse of development is deemed to be January 28, 1949, when the US President Harry S. Truman made his famous opening speech to the Congress, where he identified the Southern Hemisphere as underdeveloped and stressed the need and commitment of advanced countries to fight underdevelopment. His speech clearly marks the notion of the underdeveloped and the developed world as two separate entities where the former could be helped to achieve the developed status through all the expertise and resources that developed world had in terms of science, technology, and capital. It was in a way a self-proclaimed role devised by the great powers of the time, which found acceptance also for the world had already been witnessing founding of institutions like the World Bank, the IMF, or what uh, is popularly called as the Bretton Woods institutions, as also the UN and its various other development agencies which were supposed to carry this task. 
So this is how the development talk on the international scene begins. And with the changing international political economic focus, it took various turns and twists, most notably passing through phases like modernization theory, development and underdevelopment dependency theory, basic needs theory, post-developmental theory, and the human development theory in the 1990s. The present spatial and temporal zone of COVID-19 world has accelerated several trends important for the international politics, like the trend to globalization, the speculation regarding the crumbling of the international order, and the shifting dynamics of the global south. The crisis of multilateralism, increasing trends of authoritarian or populist regimes, the international institutions like IMF and World Bank, already due for major reforms in terms of being more inclusive, the crisis being faced by the WTO, etc. In this whole scenario, what is being witnessed as, more urgent, as, as most urgently being missed is the collective effort or the multilateral resolve for part of the world to come up with a discourse which could tap the opportunity in this crisis to give the world a more normative shape in terms of being more inclusive about the development agendas of the world. Now, the major discourse surrounding the globalization, Washington consensus, and problems of the global south, and new fissures in the global north are not settled. Rather, there are new crevices. These gaps need to be fixed by making a balance between what, may, uh, what many have asked in terms of the trade-offs between better recovery and quick wins. COVID-19 no doubt requires a massive socio-economic recovery effort. And this calls for not just speculating about the unfolding international political order, but to also call for a new kind of development politics. For one thing that has come up with this kind of unprecedented challenge in terms of non-traditional security threat is that only societies and countries which have had a robust system and network of development for their citizens have had better. And as international politics uh, debates focus on the so-called high politics or high politics games, it must never be missed that development has not a required attention despite being the buzzword that it is and despite all the hue and cry surrounding the collapse of the liberal order and most importantly being the, at the underbelly of the realities of humanity. The global community should and must devise mechanisms to treat development with the right kind of efforts and intentions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bagisa. You really completed uh, within time and very interesting um, your presentation. Uh, you brought up how the COVID-19 is going to pose further challenge and it is going to be a new development politics. We have already seen the mask, uh, you know, is being distributed by certain countries and all and how that gener generates also a kind of social capital for the countries who are sending all this help, uh, medical help and all. And uh, that also, uh, to a very large extent, uh, converts, uh, you know, this social capital to a kind of uh, influence. I will get into the, the Q&A. And now let me, we have two last speakers. Uh, uh, I, I now invite Atika Hassan, who is from the Jamia Millia Islamia. Uh, she's going to present on the declining liberal world order, which is, you know, something taking uh, from what already Dr. Bagisa has presented. So uh, over to Atika, please. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Um, I would, uh, to begin, I would like to begin with a quote by a famous uh, French philosopher and a writer, Voltaire. And um, uh, on, he had commented on the declining Holy Roman Empire, and he had said that um, the, Ro the Holy Roman, uh, the fading Holy Roman Empire, was neither holy nor Roman nor an empire. And today, some two and a half centuries later, the problem to fa paraphrase Voltaire is that the fading liberal world order is also neither liberal nor worldwide, and nor was nor is it orderly. So uh, I would uh, briefly explain the idea behind liberal order. So the liberal world order was built on the principles of openness and rule-based systems, reforms like liberal democracy, multilateral institutions, economic liberalism, security order, peaceful cooperation, um, all fell under this umbrella concept. 
um, it introduced the world with an amorphous idea of global governance, establishing institutions through which the world was to be governed. Um, and uh, fearing a repeat of the world wars, um, its purpose was to keep nations in check and to perpetually promote world peace. Uh, scholars like John Mersheimer argue that the liberal order reached its peak uh, around the year 2004, following which the world observed a liberal upheaval. And uh, the whole, um, uh, the, the world uh, witnessed its 2007 or 2008 uh, financial crisis, uh, the whole Middle Eastern uh, region went into chaos. Um, and, uh, you know, the more recent events of US exiting from the withdrawal from the Paris Agreement in 2017, or U.S.'s uh, uh, exit from Afghanistan, you know, after 19 long years of military deployments, and eventually passing on the battalion to Taliban, the you know the very organization it had went to send off, um, and the, the most recent one, which is obviously the withdrawal, with its withdrawal from the WHO, um, and all these instances um, are you know sort of examples and point towards the decline to the very tenets of the liberal order. Um, according to Merzheimer, uh, the, liberal order, the liberal world order contained the seeds of its destruction from the very beginning. So it was bound to fail because the policies on which it was built were deeply flawed. And um, so, for instance, uh, the US-led unipolar world um, extensively supported the setting up of international institutions, uh, which they envisioned to eventually benefit them. Now, the states were motivated uh, to join these organizations where they would have to follow the rules set up by these great powers. Um, so for example, uh, the USA and the USSR cooperated in setting up of the NPT agreement. Now the aim of the powers was to prevent any other nation from developing these weapons, which could obviously pose a threat to their own national security uh, in the future. So if in certain cases, these rules and laws set by these powers prevented them from carrying out their activities, uh, they either ignored them or sort of you know rewrote them. So for instance, uh, if we take the example of the US invasion in Iraq, um, so you know that was evident a violation of the international law, um, but US acted on its own interests and security of its own country, uh, disregarding the rules uh, completely. Um, now, when we talk of the basic tenets of liberal, you know, the erosions of the tenets of the liberal order, um, in this debate, uh, democracy is obviously of, of great significance. Um, and as claimed by uh, Larry Diamond, a political sociologist, the world is experiencing, experiencing what he terms as a democratic recession. And he claims that post-2006, um, the democratic breakdown uh, has taken precedence at an accelerating rate. And in addition to that, if we uh, sort of uh, observe the whole, you know, the, the whole world, um, the, the authoritarian principles have uh, deep roots in many of the societies uh, at this very particular point of time, um, you know, and these um, uh, these ideologies, these authoritarian principles, and you know, this uh, erosion of the democratic uh, principles, um, a lot of that has to do with the rise of the nationalistic ideologies, and um, it these the rise of this um, nationalistic ideology, uh, these ideologies have a lot to do with. Um, with a byproduct of the very liberal order, which is the hyperglobalization, um, you know, which eventually the coming of hyperglobalization, while it did, um, you know, help many countries in prospering, particularly China, um, but it did also bring with itself, uh, you know, economic costs like jobs and income inequality declining of, of, or in stagnant wages, etc. Um, furthermore, the growing erosions have eventually also made these democracies vulnerable to interference from external powers, like uh, China and Russia. So um, these, uh, these two countries, particularly China, they have been using this um, sort of new addition to the um, concept of power in addition to hard power, soft power. Uh, there's another concept. Known, being known as the shock power, which is based on the um, disinformation and basically the, the base is the information and the passing of information and the getting of information. So um, the, uh, these countries uh, have been seen to uh, you know, extending the manipulation of information beyond their own boundaries. And uh, these manipulations have been directed um, 
at the change at changing their own narratives in all the CAMP sectors, which are the culture, media, academia, and publishing, both within their countries as well as outside. So, uh, for example, uh, very recent examples are um, so China has threatened uh, several academic journals like Springer and Cambridge University Press for removing certain you know sensitive articles um, that were related to Taiwan or Tibet. And uh, the threat was given in the sense that you know if they do not remove those articles, then China will uh, stop their their scholars from um, browsing through these particular journals. Um, and you know all of these points and tenets uh, and the examples of, that I've given above, they point to this continuous downfall of a liberal world order. And um, although some scholars uh, do proclaim that what we are witnessing is um, it, it is a, it is a breakdown, but it is more to do with uh, uh, this uh, with the transformation of a liberal order into a more um, you know uh, inclusive and a more uh, broader concept. Um, although these debate uh, the, this idea was uh, pre uh, pre COVID time, so um, it's it's still a debate as to whether this is really a possibility post COVID or not. But uh, there are uh, certain scholars who do claim that uh, there is a possibility for, uh, you know, because it's, it's the fact that the liberal order has, is, is in decline uh, at a very fast pace. Um, but, uh, you know, and uh, China is evidently a major player, you know, and with its influence uh, spanning in major directions, in many directions. However, uh, the, 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 uh, the uh, uh, some scholars who, you know, some do claim, you know, China becoming this uh, overpowering US, which is not really a realistic possibility as of such, uh, because um, as Leon Chomsky also has mentioned, uh, had mentioned in his um, uh, webinar on the world order, he had said that China overpowering US, that's not really a possibility as of yet, uh, because, you know, in terms of resources, economy, and pretty much, you know, military, and all those things, US still is, uh, you know, at par with it. But uh, yes, it is true that US's position as a hegemon is definitely under threat, and it definitely uh, might not be a hegemon for so long, uh, which is why the possibility of a multipolar world is a uh, more, uh, uh, you know, realistic um, a sort of solution to how this world order is really going to pan out. Um, there is a possibility for a more cooperative order, although there is also a possibility, you know, with the high, uh, highly advanced technologies and surveillance system, there is a possibility that uh, the world might become, uh, you know, more um, armed with, you know, less consideration for human rights and authoritarianism, which actually is what's happening at this point of time. But, um, you know, this COVID, if nothing else, it has, you know, taught us that the world is really interconnected and everything is, you know, connected with each other, be it climate change affecting, you know, uh, loss of jobs or just everything in this world is connected and every country in a way is connected. So um, decisions of these, you know, the concept of this interdependence is of high, you know, uh, uh, importance. And um, so, you know, the United States may no longer be the whole world's so a superpower, but its influence uh, also, you know, its influence was never really uh, premised on the power alone. As I mentioned, there was the idea of soft power and there were other sets of ideas and institutional frameworks for mutual gain. So, um, you know, the chaos of pandemic is uh, only, you know, it has really highlighted and uh, exposed the very pre-existing um, uh, sort of uh, threats which already exist in the world to the liberal order. Um, however, the good thing is that now the world can, you know, really, uh, the debates have really been starting to come up at this point as uh, doctor, uh, as my previous, uh, the, uh, the previous speaker before me, Dr. Bhakti Shah had mentioned that, um, uh, you know, the uh, it's really starting to bring about and the debates have started to come as of now because of the very notion of pandemic. So uh, to end, um, as a solution, it's still hard to say, uh, you know, as a prediction, it's still a difficult task to say whether, um, what direction the world is really going to take uh, post COVID because there are chances that there might be a second wave as has come in many countries. So um, there are, uh, you know, it, it is a possibility that the world might become more cooperative, seeing that it is a dire need for that, there's a dire need for that. Um, but I mean, you know, 
realism is a very uh, pertinent thing that exists in this society for such a long time so it's really um, hard to say if leaders uh, you know uh, if the world leaders at this point are ready to sort of let go of uh, the very strong realistic ideologies that they are currently um, resuming and the anti liberal uh, uh, stance that they have been taking so uh, yeah the world the liberal world order is in decline and uh, the best option would be for a cooperative society uh, and a more multipolar world uh, but it's yet up for debate thank you thank you atika that was very interesting presentation and you really brought up uh, some of the issues of the declining of the liberal world order i think within each of the countries you see uh, you know how you know there is a decline of democracy in terms of when you see how the band and everything uh is being clamped down and nobody he can question especially in the covid-19 uh, situation i also very interesting point regarding the multipolar world order uh, though of course this has been discussed for quite some time and you know the us decline uh, probably is being used as as a kind of cliche as you said you know that us is not going to decline and china is not going to overtake very soon i think there is quite a bit of technological gap in terms of the manpower and all and i think and especially you know the sp uh, spending on r and d uh, i'm not saying that r and d very much related to the military aspect as one sees uh, in the you know in the context of china but you know that that is going to be a major uh, thing especially the covid-19 situation as it is uh, throwing up now we have the last speaker of this panel panel samiksha uh siva koti she is a research specialist from the princeton university and she is going to speak on covid-19 and it's it's going to be very very interesting because this is based on empirical uh, study of using the new york times and the gap platform uh, data so over to you samiksha hello everyone can you hear me yeah um one second i'm going to try to share my screen Can you see my screen now? Yeah. Okay. So um so uh, my research uh, is focusing a bit on empirical aspect but at the same time it ties down to COVID-19 and um uh when i say empirical i've used some of the tools but at the same time the data that has been used is pretty much um a lot of text so i think this is a new and emerging field uh, within uh social sciences um and i think it's a very important but at the same time it's also come comes with its own since it's so nascent it comes with its own challenges and uh, is still in a stage where a lot of uh, things have to be improved as such um my uh, i'm a graduate student at columbia university and i also work at uh, princeton as a research uh um staff so uh to give the policy context for this uh study uh, even within the us we saw a lot of variation in how this crisis was managed um and it created obviously a policy challenge across the world itself uh, in terms of how the pandemic unfolded but this is just to give you a sense of how within just one country the policy responses have been so different so the darker states are the states which show uh, which state implemented this particular policy sorry um so here you will see variation in in uh, across states across different policies um here you can see that there was exemption on religious gatherings on certain states but not in uh, some of them and this uh is uh this situation is obviously changed with time but this is ba uh, based on the end of march data and uh one of the very interesting thing we can see in terms of the us is also how keeping firearms um open has also been a part of covid-19 discussions because uh this uh, has also created a rise in uh the sales of firearms even before the black lives matter movement started in the US there has been uh a tendency of increased firearm sellings and this was tied down to how people felt more secure by the possession of a, a weapon 
Um, you can see how like even uh, school closures by state varied. So this was kind of like seeing this kind of policy variation also was a motivation for the study. And this kind of ties down to specifically looking at text data and uh, formal media and social media platform ties down to the previous speaker talking about how uh, misinformation and fake news uh, gets spread uh, very easily. And even in the time of COVID-19, this was seen. Uh, so you can see how digital technologies, they hold a great promise for democracy, but it can also undermine democracy through how propaganda and false news get spread. Uh, and specifically in the context of social media algorithms, they have uh, been a eco chamber in which public conversations get polluted and polarized. So this was a motivation for me to look at the text part of the um, data. So what I have done in terms of text is use some natural language processing methods. Uh, these are a bit uh, technical terms, uh, so I won't go into the detail of it. But when we look at certain corpuses within natural language processing, uh, we can compare between two sets or multiple sets of documents or, or multiple sets of data sets. So in my case, what I looked at is I looked at text which covered COVID uh, from New York Times as one set of data set. The other set of data set uh, was a Gab social platform data. And Gab is uh, pretty much a social platform data, but it's for very right wing, um, ultra right user base in the US. So this is just a synopsis of what kind of uh, data set I used. And this all uh, was pretty much till the end of March. And when I looked at bigrams, which is basically uh, up to two words, which repeat a lot as important terms in the two data sets, these were the top 10 important biograms I found for the New York Times set of articles. So you can see how the conversation from New York Times was very much about economic policy and how um, governors as well as politicians uh, were responding to the crisis in terms of what kind of packages, what kind of policy. Uh, so the, the discussion is very generic in terms of uh, um, and this is basically uh, the important terms that was highlighted by news articles that came in New York Times. So now moving further, when the Gab platform data, what was seen was a variation because with this data set, you can see how a lot of the terms point towards fake news, um, conspiracy theories, and also this whole rhetoric on how China is responsible for this virus as well as how it's compared to common cold. One of the terms that you can see is collodial silver. Um, I wasn't aware of this term uh, until this came up here and I looked into it and basically um, uh, it's a fake remedy that has been sold. Um, and also in terms of the word clouds that I played around with was able to show me how the conversations in the right-wing media platform is a lot focusing on China. Um, so just to give you a sense of uh, the GAB platform and how discussions are happening in the GAB platform, these are some of the examples. So it's very outrageous, very ultra right, and uh, a lot of fake news. So uh, it's also giving us a space, a safe heaven for um, very uh, like hate crimes. And uh, these kind of uh, discussions happen where in, in platforms like this. So you can see how coronavirus uh, being a bioweapon and made in a lab was a part of the discussion, how it's come from filthy backward societies uh, and is an outcome of globalism um, from uh, it being a source of um, being bat soup and uh, how it's also promoting a lot of hatred towards the Chinese people. Um, and uh, you can also see how fake remedies such as collodial silver is selling for almost $80 or more. And people are able to buy these kind of products which are definitely not proven medicines. And another tool that was I was able to use is called named entity extraction in which an automated um, algorithm is able to produce uh, what kind of entities are in each sets of this corpus. So for New York Times, uh, you can see uh, more of the politician um, uh, such as Andrew Cuomo, who is the governor of New York, uh, Donald Trump, Joe Biden, Boris Johnson, these came up. But for interesting part for me was to see how Bill Gates comes in the top 
uh, entity as uh, of uh, discussion in the gap platform data and this comes from the fact that bill gates has become the center of right wing conspiracy theories as he has been called as being the person who created uh, covid um, Alex Jones, uh, again, is the person who was selling a lot of these coronavirus fake cures. Um, so these are some more other tools that I played around with uh, in terms of the natural language processing tools. And uh, this, uh, for instance, uh, shows how similar these data sets were, and they were about 50% similar. Um, also, um, the readability measure is one of the tools which we can use. Uh, and the fact that gap data has a higher score just means that it's easier to read. And um, uh, so this probably also hints towards how uh, it is focusing on people who understand um, certain language structures better or so. Um, but this is still something that's in um, uh, needs more research and discussion uh, and is a more, as I said, an ascent field of natural language processing. Uh, however, uh, uh, we could also do something called topic modeling uh, by putting in a bunch of text uh, and see what kind of topics we receive. Um, so this is for the data set from uh, empirical study of conflict, uh, COVID disinformation stories. And this gave a, this also gives us a sense of for the COVID disinformation stories, these were a lot of the topics that come up in disinformation stories. Uh, which is a lot of fake uh, cures and remedies and uh, people promoting a lot of fake news. And uh, what I want to also show is spread, spread of fake news on social media is not just limited to the pandemic as we were discussing on with uh, previous panelists that uh, I could uh, also look into the similar thing using US elections of 2016 where um, we, uh, we have data sets produced by BuzzFeed and PolitiFact sites, which have been labeled as fake or not fake. And in this, what was seen is certain topics pertaining to Hillary Clinton came up more on the fake category. So that's what I wanted to highlight. Like you can see here, topic 10, for instance, is uh, here on the fake category. And that's uh, relating to uh, the Clinton Health Access Initiative and this theory that they gave watered down HIV aid uh, uh, medicines to people in Africa. So this was uh, some kind of fake news that was circulating during that time to undermine the candidate running. And so um, uh, uh, this uh, kind of also hints towards how uh, fake news is used to target political opponents. Uh, even in the PolitiFact data set, uh, this uh, was seen how certain topics were fake, uh, more towards, uh, more skewed towards uh, Clinton compared to the opposite opposite candidate. And so I think uh, at the end, what I want to say is these uh, new tools also need to be incorporated uh, as we study about these misinformation and fake news and uh, in order to promote um, global cooperation to tackle with these kind of propaganda and fake news and just how should uh, public uh, be able to verify their source of news and information and report any kind of suspicious behavior. So there have been some efforts that have been taken down, uh, recently by Twitter and Facebook uh, in terms of removing fake news uh, pertaining to COVID-19. Um, but uh, uh, again, uh, we're going to see more elections and um, uh, with that, how uh, should these kind of uh, companies focus on um, reducing um, these kind of propaganda and misinformation that gets us spread. And finally, I leave you with the question that um, how should social media channels and platforms be made more responsible? Perhaps uh, should they even be regulated in order to safeguard our rights to accurate information and news as that is a very, very foundational factor to democracy. So with that, I leave you here. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, uh, Samit Sayah. That was very, uh, you know, uh, you succinctly brought out, uh, you know, the challenges which most of us we are facing in terms of the fake news and our inability to distinguish between what actually is the real news and what is the fake news. And especially in the COVID-19 situation, when many people do not uh, know how to get themselves treated, uh, such kind of uh, fake news also 
in a sense create a kind of a panic but also at the same time i found it very very interesting the kind of terminology uh, which was thrown up by the you know the two uh, uh, comparison you made in terms of the new york times and the gap uh, uh, the, you know platform uh, especially in the real estate uh, is something which many people even would not think but it is very interesting perhaps in terms of you know the decrease of the real estate price perhaps uh, in the in the covid 19 situation uh, may have made it uh, to the list i think uh, the question which you put uh, towards the end is is perhaps a very very difficult question you know how to regulate uh, the social media though to a very large extent some of the countries are taking certain measures to stop certain kind of news uh, to spread but i think uh, at this point of time these are in very nascent uh, stage and it's going to be very difficult how are we going to manage now uh, taking into account i think we have uh, nearly 15 minutes so let's uh, get into the q and a and i think all of you must have seen uh, the questions uh, which uh, is there in the in the chat box uh, there are some some question to Namrata. Uh, you have a question on uh, globalization in terms of space and what kind of partnership China is looking uh, towards and who could be uh, those partners. And there is uh, one for uh, Dr. Jivanta. That is how important is the role of transparency in sense of the political system uh, in the disengagement process. Of course, I have a question from Jivanta. Like for example. At one point of time, you know, this um, China-India model uh, was being sold to the India-Pakistan, you know, saying that put uh, the conflict uh, into a back into the back burner and try to improve the trade and all. But uh, after seeing what has happened, one really wonder what that mod whether that model is something which which is sustainable. And to Dr. Swasti, this was this question about. A string of pearls, uh, whether it is a failure of India's uh, engagement with, with its neighbor. And there is a second question which speaks about uh, since China contributes a lot to the peacekeeping operation. So whether a peacekeeper in Africa, you know, they are going, they are protecting the Chinese interests since China contributes a lot to the uh, peacekeeping in Africa or whether it is just a humanitarian assistance. So, uh, how do you explain the dichotomy? And uh, uh, I have a question also to Samixia. Uh, you know, when you, when you make this kind of analysis, very, very interesting. In, though, of course, you know, it's very difficult for me to understand the methodology, you know, the manner in which you did it. Uh, you know, the, uh, this is something in the COVID-19 uh, situation, the manner in which the U.S. has man managed or mismanaged, uh, you know, the COVID-19 process especially with so many uh, people have died. What is the reaction? You know, there, there was no reaction how people look at the Trump. You said that, you know, Hillary Clinton thing was brought in, but what was the reaction to Trump's management policy, whether you see any right winger or the New York Times coming up with any kind of criticism from the analysis which you did? Uh, over to, uh, to all of you. So Nami, you can go first. Yeah, thank you, uh, Suti. So the question that was put to me is that, could you please emphasize more on the concept of globalization in terms of space? Uh, what, can, what are the kinds of partnership China is looking at uh, uh, towards and with which nations? So yeah, space is actually what globalization is about. So uh, the, as I said, the fact that we are able to use vir uh, virtual world, we are able to compress space and time, the fact that we are, I am across oceans in the world and I'm, I'm able to speak to you uh, without much latency is because of space-based support systems. So globalization by which in definition means the compression of time and space, uh, outer space plays the most critical role. Now in terms of China, uh, what kind of relationship it's looking at in terms of globalization. So Chinese space policymakers, especially those who I've interviewed in my field trip to China were about looking at space as a global common. And so uh, interestingly, they were offering their permanent space station, which they are launching next year to the world. They signed an MOU with the United Nations Office on Outer Space Affairs, in which they offered their space station to anyone, any university or nation that would want to send their science program. Now, remember, the, it's important to realize that 
China and the US cannot have any kind of space cooperation. It is banned by a congressional legislation. And so my argument has been that that actually has led to China developing its indigenous capacity in space. And the first time that capacity became very clear to the US was that when it land, landed on the far side of the moon. And this actually challenged the US arguments that I hear here. I live in the US and these arguments are very common that China is just following US, is just copying US technology or is using Russian technology. But actually Russia never landed on the far side of the moon. And that was when the Chinese space uh, scientists actually demonstrated a new technology and that actually awakened the US to China's capability. Now, in terms of partnership, China has very strong relationship with Russia. Historically, Russia had helped China in its space program. Uh, it is looking for partnership with countries along the Belt and Road Initiative. It launched a satellite, as you know, for Pakistan. Uh, it wants to help Bangladesh in terms of launch of its uh, own uh, satellite system, Sri Lanka. So it's very, very uh, strong in terms of South Asia and also offering its Baidu navigation network to Southeast Asia. So uh, China actually is pretty much uh, ahead in terms of offering its space systems to countries in Africa. But what is interesting is that it, it locates that particular cooperation within the Belt and Road Initiative. As, as you know, today, China even has a health silk road in which it's offering its COVID-19 cooperation to the world based on space systems. So, and, and it using health apps that are connected to space. So it, it's actually very much ahead. I'll finally end by, because Smriti, you raised some interesting points and I thought it would be important to respond for the purpose of a general conversation. So you said that would it lead to militarization of space, the kind of developments that are happening. I would argue that space is already militarized. You have space command and control. You have military satellites over you that are spying on you. You have ASET weapons that have been tested by US, Russia, China, and India. I think yeah. the key question today is not militarization, but weaponization. So will you actually locate weapon systems in space? The Outer Space Treaty prohibits any kind of nuclear weapons in any celestial body. And I think that is where the concern is, that would it lead, because of the establishment of new space forces and the, and the sudden rise of space is an important component of who a country is, could it lead to some kind of basis on the moon, for example? But you know, you have the Outer Space Treaty that actually does not allow that. So we do have a legal system in place. Now, the last point that I would want to make is that there is this assumption that China is very much behind the US in terms of technology. But actually statistics does not support that kind of argument. And especially in terms of very future technologies like artificial intelligence, uh, robotics, quantum, China is ahead today. The National Science Foundation data that I use actually pointed out in 2019, 2018, 2019, that even when it came to research and development, R&D, China spends about $409 billion, second to the US, who is not even in a 500 billion category, but 496 billion. So you can see that China is actually a very strong second. And I think where uh, we have to be concerned and actually for that, we need to look at more uh, Chinese sources as Dr. Swati Rao was mentioning that you need to understand China and what it's doing internally. So even when you look at the kind of focus that China has today, uh, you would be surprised to know that Chinese peer reviewed articles on science and math have overtaken the US according to the National Science Foundation. And, and they're cited more in the world. So you can see the where China is going. It's, it's using its technological developments to actually create influence, create conditions for its legitimacy. And when President Xi became president in 2013, I was listening Let to- Let me wind up first. Yeah, I will, I will. And so when I was listening to that speech, uh, the China dream speech, I think President Xi very clearly articulated three core areas. One is innovation, second is technology and three is space. So you can see that China is actually following that particular uh, you know, strategic game plan that he offered in 2013. So I'll end there, thank you. Thank you, Namrita. Uh, I think each, each one of you, if you can take three minutes, I don't want to you know, wind up, uh, I have already done that. Now next is uh, uh, Dr. Swasti Rao and after that Jivanta and last is Samitsya.
Sorry, some is some is saying being last because he presented last. Uh, Dr. Smriti, I have yeah. a few questions. I have two questions, uh, so I'd be answering probably later. Is that okay? Okay, okay, okay. That's be very quick, please. Thank you. Yeah, sure. So that, yeah. Shall I begin answering? Yeah, questions? yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, all right. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, thank you for the questions. I think uh, what I'll do is that I will try to be very brief. The first question that was asked to me was about the United Nations peacekeeping and the Chinese role in it. Um, uh, like um, which, which is rightly pointed out, that China is also you know like the largest aid giver to United Nations peacekeeping, and then also sends troops, which is quite unique because generally you have a north and south divide, okay, in United Nations peacekeeping budgeting and troop uh, sending. So, uh, with respect to your specific question, if I can be very short. You see, I get it. What you mean to ask me is that China has considerable presence in Africa. Chinese peacekeepers, uh, Chinese peacekeepers, about a thousand peacekeepers are in South Sudan, and uh, you know, which is East Africa. And then there are also other missions which are in happening in Congo, which is Central Africa. Liberia is far West Africa. Mali is also West Africa. So, uh, well, yes, there is a quite of research that suggests that. Um, Yes, there could be a very damaged correlation to the to the fact that China is protecting its economic interests. Uh, a, they started with the anti-piracy, but then once the anti-piracy thing went out of window, they uh, started to um, you know uh, basically kind of evolve and then still maintain the presence and ultimately it culminated in having a base in Djibouti. And then along with that, they also have a proxy presence by way of the United Nations peacekeeping uh, you know organization. And if you see now, especially, this is also quite important because now, um, you know, in East of Africa that we were discussing, like the Gulf of Aden and the whole of Africa is East of Africa. But if you travel to West of Africa, uh, in the Gulf of Guinea, is where the current, uh, so to say, concentration of, uh, you know, piracy is, is happening. And uh, the, the uh, presence of Chinese peace peacekeepers in those regions um, comes pretty handy. So that is my answer to that first question. The other question, the other question, the other question which was asked to me was uh, about. Uh, uh, I, one second, let me go to the other question that was asked to me. China's string of pearls. Uh, China's string <laughs> of pearls. Okay, yeah, that's my daughter. I'm sorry. <laughs> so China's string of pearls and whether it is a failure. Uh, well, again, a very short uh, reply to this would be that. Um, China's string of policy, irrespective of the fact whether India's foreign policy to its neighbors uh, would have been more proactive or more engaging, China would have still, uh, you know, tried to protect its blocks and try to, you know, sort of develop the bases where it's developing because that logic is coming from protecting their sea lane of communication and not merely encircling India. Okay, so India seems to be pretty obsessed with the fact that China is encircling India, which cannot be completely denied. Of course, it cannot be completely denied. It's there, and India need to take, you know, note of it. And that is why the Wuhan consensus was such a big relief for us because you know it said that fine, you know, India can have their uh, influence in the Indian Ocean region, while I, we have our influence in the South China Sea. So having said that, uh, again, uh, the answer is that I don't think that even if India had been more proactive in pursuing the foreign policy with Bangladesh and you know these countries or Maldives, because these are the countries which are all the time criticized, uh, India is criticized for, they would have still gone ahead with acquiring uh, you know bases and developing their bases out there. So you know whether it's uh, the Hamam Tota port in Sri Lanka or Maldives or uh, you know the Chittagong in Bangladesh or uh, you know Gwadar in Pakistan and now latest being Chabahar. So I think it's more to do with the fact that they are protecting China's economic interests. But yes, um, it cannot be denied that India needs to take a very serious note of it, and India is taking definitely. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jibanta. Thanks. I'll also try and be short. Uh, basically, I'll take three sort of questions. Thank you to uh, Shubra and Dr. Patnaik. Uh, so on your first point about if transparency is important, especially, I suppose, in a democracy, um, I mean, I don't know if any democracy when it comes to defense and national security is going to be particularly transparent. Um, but I guess maybe more important is clarity, because that's very important for messaging and signaling, especially when you're dealing with a powerful player. And I mean, if you look back to what happened in the 1950s and how that 
um, led up to the 1962 war. Of course, there were big geopolitical events going on that fed into that uh, outbreak, but there was also a lot of mixed messaging and signaling, which was both a result of intransparency, but also a complete lack of clarity, I think, on what Indian policymakers at the time wanted to do with regards to the border and what kind of message they wanted to send to the Chinese. So I think that's different today. There's much more clarity. Transparency, in transparency, there probably will continue to be. And I don't think that's different from any other uh, country or democracy. On your question about can India stand its ground? So there I see two aspects. You're asking, can India stand its ground on the specific issue of disengagement? And I would say, why not? Um, the domestic consensus is very strong. At the moment, international support has been voiced, not just by the United States, but by also others. The Europeans are the weaklings all the time who never want to commit. But I think um, Russia has also showed some element. I mean, Rajnath Singh was in Moscow, and, and that seemed like a positive um, trip overall. Um, and the institutional mechanisms are working of communication, the channels of communication. So I think India is in a strong position to maintain its firmness on disengagement. If you're asking about India's ability to continue with ambiguity and this discussion around strategic autonomy on a sort of bigger geopolitic strategic level, I guess that is something we can all have our opinion on and debate um, whether with all these developments regarding the Quad and Indo-Pacific, whether India is clearly falling into a anti-China uh, deterrent uh, balancing um, coalition. But I think that's still up for a lot of discussion. Um, thirdly, the question on the China-India model, I agree with Dr. Patnaik. I think it was it also in the literature, it was discussed as something very clever um, to put the issue aside and focus on economic relations. Um, maybe it was possible in the 80s and 90s, given what the two countries were going through. But recent developments, whether it's the BRI, whether it's China's growing interest and presence in South Asia, but also India's willingness to be assertive or to take radical steps like the abrogation of 370, the union statehood of Ladakh, which radically challenges some of the assumptions on the issue of territory that were put on the back burner during the 90s. I think that has brought it. Mm -hmm. So we have to rethink um, the rules of engagement and the rules of the game at play, because it is, after all, a game. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank so much. you. Thank you, Jivanta. Samiksa? Um, thank you for the questions. So I think one of the questions that uh, was asked is how is um, the reaction to Trump's um, handling of the uh, pandemic and uh, there also there is a lot of variation in the US in terms of how right-wing um, supporters are looking into the issue versus uh, the other and I think um, that's definitely created a challenge because uh, Trump himself has been a promoter of hydroxychloroquine as a remedy when it has not mm -hmm. been um, uh, not been approved. And he himself has uh, been at the forefront of a lot of these issues and is playing on um, China virus or uh, the Kung Fu virus kind of rhetoric in the upcoming elections to put the onus of the blame on uh, completely China. So I think uh, there's definitely those kind of issues there in how conversations are being shaped um, with this. And I think um, that's a big challenge. And also with right-wing supporters uh, recently, there was also this issue of how mask kills or ma mask is not something that they want to use. So this again comes down to the issue of like, where do you draw the line between personal freedom versus uh, responsibility towards your community? So I think this is a very big challenge in the context of the US right now and definitely something that needs uh, a lot of uh, thinking into. Um, and with that, I, uh, the other question that was posed to me was how do we look into these uh, spread of misinformation in areas which may not be equipped with technology? I think um, for areas where there is uh, the, uh, the access to at least Facebook or WhatsApp, I think at least uh, the Facebook, uh, WhatsApp are kind of or companies or organizations which can invest in uh, dealing with these issues and they have the infrastructure to do so. And in, in the context of a pandemic, I think there's also that incentive uh, also from the state to uh, invest in these um, kind of uh, efforts and also uh, for areas which are not, uh, which are even further backward, I think we can look into supporting grassroots local organizations and um, 
volunteers who are trying and journalism like grassroots local journalism is also really trying to tackle with these issues so how can those uh, organizations be supported i think uh, the challenge uh, is not as tricky in terms of incentive when it comes to a pandemic as such to uh, to try to invest in this but i think the challenge comes in further when it comes to issues like elections and when there is vested interest in uh, political parties to um, spread uh, misinformation, uh, which serves in their interests. And I think it come, becomes very tricky as to how do you regulate such a thing? And can you even create an independent body that uh, may be not influenced by a particular political agenda to look into these issues? So I think that's a big challenge of this um, social media generation. Thank you. Subra? Uh, yes, I'll make it really quick. Um, I had this question which said that if the trickle down effect from the West uh, would actually have an impact on India with respect to its stand on the nuclear norms, I do not agree with it because uh, it's not the belief in the arms control, but rather the belief, the belief in the other side getting hold of arms that really governs the norms order. In fact, India has been kind of fighting this norms order from the times when it was against NPT to being in favor of NPT. And the external factors have really never affected the Indian stand on the norms. Uh, it's also interesting to know that the uh, American physicist Oppenheimer used to consult Gita before taking decisions. So India has had a very different kind of impact on the norms order, even when it wasn't there in the global map. Second, with respect to non-state actors, which Smriti uh, had pointed out, I personally have issues in the way they are dealt with, not only in the uh, nuclear weapons scenario, even if in general, because the states do not are not ready to cooperate with each other due to the fear of public shaming. That's why we don't have strict mechanisms to kind of control them. If there are whistleblowers, they'll be kidnapped, murdered, transported to other places. So non-state actors are definitely a problem for me, but I'm still an optimist. I don't think nuclear weapons are for use. They're more for political leverage and I'm going to wind up there. Thank you. Uh, Atika, are you there? Yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. Yeah, there is a question for you. Yeah. So um, the first half of the question, um, very briefly, it's uh, as I mentioned in my paper also, the liberal order has always been very problematic and uh, it has always been hierarchical. So when the when the, 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 the idea behind this was formed, it was very evident that uh, the powers that had, you know, designed the very idea took, a, you know, designed it in a way that the benefits would, they would be reaping more benefits than the other states. It was never equal. It was based on that premise, but it was never equal. So that it was always very hierarchical. And uh, that is why, um, you know, the problem of underdeveloped countries that you mentioned. Um, secondly, um, yes, uh, China has, you know, usurped. China has definitely, uh, second part of the question, uh, China has definitely, uh, you know, gained massive influence in the global arena and that's a very uh, that's a very true fact um and but however that also has a lot to do with the fact that all you know globally many countries have also lost uh, uh trust on in the us so you know it has worked in addition to that and um apart from that uh, uh apart from that uh, there's also the fact that um you know, what China has done in gaining its influence, it has provided countries with opportunities and, you know, its strategy has been outward. While US's, you know, recent strategy can be seen as moving more inward, more domestic, uh, which has obviously created this sort of, uh, you know, division in, you know, obviously, you know, creating more mistrust and the things that have been happening within the country. So the one lesson that the West can learn from, the China, from China as of, you know, its practices of, you know, um, the debt trap policy and everything, I think one would be that it needs to remember and uh, remember that the very premise was based on the fact of cooperation and the support from different countries and more states. Um, you cannot survive in the world by being yourself. Yes, US is a very strong power. Yes, it has the resources and the military capability and the economy, but um, it cannot stand up against the whole world, uh, you know, uh, it, it needs the support and that is what China has been doing. It has been trying to gain support. Yes, the, the many countries that it has gained support from are not 
heavily like they're not really highly developed countries but yes i think the one lesson that not to learn but to remember for the us is to gain the idea of cooperation and uh, supporting each other in that idea back thank you thank you so much i think uh, you know i would like to thank each of the panelists and uh, for Uh, and i was very happy in terms of the kind of uh, you know topic which we were discussing today very very educative as far as uh, i am concerned and uh, i you know good night to some of us who are in this part of the world and good day to some of others who are not in this part of the world uh, thank you pramod thank you so much and it is really wonderful to have all of you in this panel bye bye good night Thank you so much Dr. Smriti for helping us moderate the session. With this we have come to an end of the session and I express my gratitude to moderators, people presenters and participants without whom this virtual summit would not have been possible. And we hope to see you at our other events too and thank you so much for being a part. Thank you. Of